Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The Lord will reign forever and ever. That's our text. If you buy a lottery ticket, what are the odds you'll actually win the Powerball? Anyone happen to know? Multi-state Powerball odds are 800, 185 million to one. Well, one's going to win. Not very good odds, though. If you play baseball in high school, we got a few baseball players here. The odds of you making the major leagues are 6,600 to one. Same odds that someone might guess your four-digit pin on the first try. The odds of you being struck by lightning are three million to one. And by the way, you don't want the world record for the number of times being struck by lightning. That belongs to Roy Sullivan, who was struck seven times. He is a park ranger outside high elevation. He had no more hair, though, and scars all over his body when he passed away. The most important, what are the odds Story and events, though, and question is this. What are the odds the man could be brutally beaten, crucified by the Roman Empire, and come back to life? What are the odds of that? Well, those would be astronomical, but it happened. It happened, and we profess it today. And we also possess this good news today that Christ is alive. His grave is still empty. And the goal of this sermon is to, one, profess that good news, to proclaim it to the world, to one another, to sing it out loud, to claim it, but also to possess that for ourselves, to own it for ourselves today. Easter happened, that's profess. Easter is happening right now in me. That's to possess it. Today we're wrapping up our sermon series on the book of Exodus. If you've been with us through the season of Lent, you'll recognize these moments and monuments in the book of Exodus in our series, Let My People Go. For what it's worth, next week we start a new series on the prophet Ezekiel, and it's perfect for Easter. How God makes all things new. So you're in the right place today. Where we come to Exodus 15. And we see the odds of this Israelite people, state slaves, defeating the most powerful military force on earth, the Egyptians, led by mean and mighty Pharaoh. The odds are absolutely against them. Everything is stacked up not in their favor. The drama beginning in Exodus 1, where the Egyptians put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, who worked them ruthlessly, they made their lives bitter, bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. Remember that Sunday school story, perhaps. But then remember how it gets worse. It gets worse for them because then Pharaoh says, well, now make them collect straw themselves. Don't provide the straw for the bricks. They need to go out and get their own straw and still make the same number of bricks. The quota doesn't change. Pharaoh is using his bricks and whips and his worst tricks, and it does get even worse. As the Israelites are fleeing Egypt, finally Pharaoh says, let them go, reluctantly. Then Israel finds themselves looking over their shoulders and they see Pharaoh running after him, after them, chasing and screaming, you'll have hell to pay now. But it gets even worse. Because the Israelites, they get to the Red Sea and they're surrounded and they're stuck on all sides. There's no going back. There's no going around. There's no way out except God. We get to Exodus 14. They said to Moses, this is how bad it got, by the way, was it because there were no graves in Egypt 
that you brought us out in the wilderness to die? <laughs> Goodness, that's pretty bad. The odds were completely against Israel, except for God. So it's no wonder Exodus 15, Easter morning, we're celebrating with them this hallelujah. Pharaoh's chariots and army, he is hurled into the sea. The finest of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. Imagine all of your enemies on your necks, and then suddenly they're gone. It's no wonder Israelites, is, they're singing in verse 2, the Lord, Yah, that's God's nickname if you didn't know, Yah for Yahweh, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. It's the first Alleluia chorus. And then Exodus 15, 3, Yahweh is a man of war. Yahweh is his name, right? God is fighting for them, the same God who fights for you. All of this, though, is just a peek. It's a prelude, it's a preview into the Bible's greatest against all odds story. Why we're here today. Opposition began early and often in Christ's ministry. Pharisees plotted with the Herodians. Detractors said he's demon-possessed. Scribes test him with Torah trivia. His own brothers ride and ridicule him, Sadducees posture with Pentateuchal pride, and it gets worse. Christ indeed has hell to pay. But once arrested, Jesus is bound, accused, blindfolded, mocked, and worse, they strip him naked to humiliate him as much as possible, and then they beat him into a bloody pulp. It actually happened. And even worse, Jesus, blood-soaked, is spiked to a tree for six hours. Imagine the horror. Crucified, dead, and buried is your Jesus. Just when everyone thought it was all over, and everyone else thought it was all over, you hear the angel. The angel announces he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. And Mary shouts, Rabboni, and then Thomas for the ages, my Lord and my God. Against all the odds, Jesus lives. Hallelujah. Jesus lives. But sometimes we think it's all over for us. It's all over for you, your job, your family, your health, life itself. No way out. If you are in that position today, completely stuck on all sides, trapped in, hear your Jesus, alive and well. Shout to your enemies, let my people go. Let them go. Remember, the goal of the sermon is not just to profess Easter. That's good. It's also to possess Easter. Easter happened. We proclaim it. We profess it. But Easter can happen in you, and it is. That's to possess it. That's to own it. But there are at least three barriers for all of us in possessing Easter. First, I find, is growing up in a family that, well, isn't much of a family. It doesn't work. Maybe you run into people like I do, and they're walking zombies because... Well, when they were children, something was broken. Something was broken, and now they're a third or halfway through life, and they're starting to think that what's broken can never be fixed. What's sick can never be healed. What's lost could never be found. I'm talking to, because I know you're here, and I'm talking about the one in three people whose parents were divorced but also the one in four women who were sexually abused as children. I know you're listening. I'm talking to the one in seven people who grew up with an alcoholic parent. I'm talking to the people who grew up in families with absentee dads, controlling moms, screaming parents, abusive 
siblings, I know you're here. And Jesus wants you to hear his good news. You feel as though the odds are against you, but Jesus, my friends, is for you. Another barrier we experience is a devastating loss. For some of you, that means your spouse died, or maybe your marriage died, or it feels like it is dying. Maybe your child died, or your father died. For others, it means your dream died, and I'll venture to guess there's some here today who are feeling as though their will to live has died. Most days it feels, if you're in that place, that Mount Everest is sitting on your chest, crushing what's left of your life, and you feel as though the odds are against you. Friends, listen to your living Jesus today. Or maybe we're crippled by a destructive habit. What is it in your life? What is it in your sphere of this world? What is it for you? Maybe it's the gambling that's gotten out of hand, or the drugs, or the alcohol, or the pornography. Maybe it's work, and then more work, and then more work. I heard a guy say, I spent my entire childhood feeling invisible. There was no abuse or other stuff like that. I just felt invisible. I wanted to say, hey, I'm here. I'm a little person with a love-starved heart. Would you please notice me and see me and convince me that I matter? You know anyone who can feel lonely in a crowded room? I've been there. For this man, though, it never happened. For this man... He's now addicted to his boat and his booze and his big bucks. I just imagine maybe someone here can relate to that. You feel as though the odds are against you. Friend, listen to your living Jesus today. All the odds were against a man named Lee Caps. Anyone remember who Lee Caps was? This is a little bit of an older story, but goodness, it's a good one. You might have followed his story a while back. He didn't know how to fly, but he got in a plane anyway. When he got in a plane, it was a private plane, and his friend was the pilot, and they're up at altitude, and his friend has a heart attack and dies. What do you do if you're at altitude, and your friend is the pilot and dies? Well, you get on the radio like Lee Caps, and you cry for help. An air traffic controller in Renton, Washington, that'd be Washington State, heard Lee's cry and said, Lee, this is your lucky day. I'm not just an air traffic controller. I'm also a flight instructor. Would you be interested in a flying lesson, he asked Lee. Of course. <laughs> of course. Being otherwise occupied, Lee said, sure, why not? The air traffic controller said, Lee, you're going to have to try. You're just going to have to do it. You're going to have to take a shot at landing the plane. No practice, no dress rehearsal, no spring training. You're going to have to do it. Well, he came in like a drunk duck. He's all over the place. He hit pretty hard, but Lee Caps actually walked away from that landing with only a few minor cuts. And afterwards, the air traffic controller was interviewed by the TV stations, and they asked him, did you really think he would walk away alive? And the air traffic controller said, folks, Lee Caps made it against all odds. True story. True story. Friends, a lot of true stories. Against all odds. Stuff is going on. A whole lot of stuff, not just in the world, but in our people's lives. And you're circling the runway and you're just, you're just trying to land. Your greatest fear is that you might crash and burn. I've been there. But let me remind you of two honest-to-goodness facts. Against all odds, one, Israel made it out of Egypt. <laughs> they really did. But better yet, against all odds, Jesus Christ is alive today. He's risen for you today. 
We profess Easter with every ounce of our being, but God, we long to possess Easter with every ounce of our being. I almost feel like it couldn't happen. But God says it can. The Messiah has an hallelujah for you. You know this story too? George Frederick Handel, if you know the name Handel, this is why you would know it. He wrote the, he wrote the Alleluia Chorus and the Messiah Cantata that was written in 1741, but years before in 1704, he almost never got there because he was at a premiere with his good friend and they were the musicians in this premiere and well, he decided not to get up from his seat on the organ bench. And his friend called him out. His friend was supposed to take the seat on the organ bench halfway through the performance, and he called him out, and he said, we're going to have a duel right now, right here, outside, buddy. And his friend took a sword and aimed it straight at his heart, and he struck him straight at the heart and hit a button instead <laughs> and deflected the sword and saved his life. What are the odds? <laughs> What are the odds of that? And then 37 years later in the springtime, his career winding down, running out of money, Easter time, he writes in 24 days, he writes Handel's Messiah as we know it in the Alleluia Chorus, and he includes these words, and he shall reign forever and ever. Who is that? That's the one Paul says, live in you today. Paul says we can possess this Easter with our own hallelujah today. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. That's a present tense, folks. Here now, no matter how dark the world gets, or how it looks in your life. Your Jesus is for you. Listen to him. Through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, Easter is happening in us. God promising resurrection for everything and everyone that looks so lifeless and hopeless and dead. Listen to your Jesus who has conquered your enemies of sin and death and the devil. Shout today, let him go, let her go. Let my children go. The Holy Spirit is making this alive and real for you. John 14, Jesus says it this way. Let not your hearts be troubled. Right? Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus, who is truly God. And then he goes on and he says this. Because I live, you will live. Easter happened. That's profess. Easter is happening in me, in you. That's possessed. That's owning it. That's believing it. That's living it now, and we will live forever. Friends, you have a word for that. We have a word for for all of this. And what would that word be? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, keep us in your peace. You, Lord Jesus, who live and reign forever and ever, be our peace. Amen.